goodness. Jeez. All right. You guys ready? Happy Easter, everybody. If we are going to start out with reading God's Word this morning, so if you want to get to your feet, we're reading out of Matthew 28. The cool part about this section of the Bible is that the entirety of the Bible before this points to this spot, and everything after it points back to it, and it's still the reason that we believe what we believe. Without this, that what we believe is just foolishness. So, Now, after the Sabbath... Towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there is a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Father, thank you for this day and this time. And God, I just thank you that Easter is just a reminder of why we do what we do and why you did what you did, Father. And God, I just ask that today is special, that today ignites something in us that might have died, Father. And I just ask that for the rest of this day, that we remember this day for what it is. It's about you. Everything we do from here on after is about you and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. It's so good to have you here with us this morning. Um, I'm going to go through some announcements this morning. Sorry. Um, there will be no evening services tonight. We hope that you use this time to celebrate our risen Savior with your friends and your family and enjoy, just enjoy that time together. Um, there is a wedding shower table <laughs> for Caitlin and Austin out in the foyer. If you would like to bless them in that way, um, just stop by that and, yeah, drop off a present. Um, just a reminder, there is nursery for kids, zero to Three. If you go out the foyer and then go left, you will see it. And um, we would love to have your kiddos in there. Um, I've been in the nursery the past two weeks, and it's been so fun. And um, we love loving on your kiddos and just enjoy um, being with them. There's also children's church for pre-K to first. We go downstairs after Trent dismisses, and um, for that, and there's a cry room in the back. If you go out into the foyer and go left, there's a cry room in the back that you guys can still be with us, um, hear it, and see it, and whatever, um, if needed. I think that's everything. Um, we're truly happy that you have joined us this morning. Um, and yeah, let's go to learn prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning just so thankful, just so thankful that we're able to gather together and praise you and what you've done on the cross, Lord, that you have, you truly have risen indeed, Lord, and we're just so thankful for that. Um, our whole faith just stands on that, and um, and we recognize that, Lord. I just pray that you would be with everyone here this morning, that you would just be on our hearts and our, open our ears, Lord, that we would just be in your house this morning and just um, that we'd walk away changed this morning. God, I just pray that you would be with Pastor Trent as he brings your word, that you would just bless him and guide him, and that you would just use him as your vessel this morning. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, church. He is risen. Amen. What a day. Uh, what a special time that this is that we get to baptize Ella Abels. This is the daughter of Ethan and Carla Abels. Uh, that we get to baptize her on this day where we remember that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And we can see the picture of Ella having been dead in her sins, but now having raised to new life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so it's just it's just amazing how the Lord works these things out. Ella came searching or you know hunting me down after uh, church last Sunday, and she said, "I I want to be baptized." And so she met with the elders, and we talked uh, about salvation. And she was like, she understood, I am a sinner, and I need a savior. And I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And she was very articulate. She explained the gospel to me. 
in, in ways that I've, I've seen adults struggle. Uh, but she was she was more eloquent than, than some adults. And so I was just like, wow, the spirit is truly on this little girl. And so what a joy it is that I have uh, the privilege to, to baptize you this morning. Ella, I have one very important question for you. So who do you confess as your Savior and Lord? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is her confession. And so I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. And race to walk in newness of life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that uh, for, for your great grace, for your gospel, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, you are truly mighty and able to save, and you are saving children and people of all ages and so i pray that your gospel would permeate the hearts of, of maybe those who might not know you this morning and that they too would would one day soon join us in in following you in baptism and following you into eternal life we ask all this in jesus name amen In 
not hold without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
All right, you guys go ahead and take a seat. And if whoever's doing offering would come forward. And then immediately after we pray for offering, we are going to have some young kids come up here. Uncle Dan. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for all that it means, and I thank you for this time of offering, Lord, that allows us to give back a portion of what you've given us. And I pray that you would bless each and every family that came out today and and, and is in your house, and that you would continue to lead and guide all of us in directions that you'd have us to go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Exodus wickedness, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second King, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Solomon, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, George, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Ahim, the Baptist, Zechariah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Romans 3.23, we love because he first loved us. Hey, go see it, go see it. Can you say it? First John, John 3.16, so God loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. All right. I'm with Barrett on this one. So that was well worth hearing. So you, um, we did offering, right? It happened. It happened. All right. I guess get to your feet and we'll close it out with one last song. Just sing with all your heart this morning. We got two more songs? Well, no. Uh, Yeah. 
You guys go ahead and have a seat. We're going to do Lord's Supper. Good morning again. He is risen. Amen. Don't, uh, forgive me if I do that a few more times. That's It's fun. So I am so happy that you all are here to join us for worship this morning. And I mean, just God's blessing being poured out upon us all uh, as we have been able to witness a baptism. We've been able to uh, praise and worship the Lord and Savior with so many voices and just sounding like just the voices of God's people being raised up into the heavens and then also partaking in the Lord's Supper uh, just all around. Just a wonderful, wonderful day. And what makes it especially uh, special is that it is Resurrection Sunday, uh, the, the day that we highlight not only that Christ has died for our sins, but he has been raised from the dead. Amen. So I'm actually going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking, beginning in verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so today, the special day that is set aside every year to, to really highlight Again, not only that Christ has died for sins, but that he has been raised to, to life. He has conquered the grave. In fact, that's exactly what we celebrate every single time that we partake of the Lord's Supper. Just as Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, that every single time we partake, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. And so... 
Jesus is, in fact, going to return. I know that the, the world thinks that we're foolish and that he's not going to return, that he's been, where is your Lord? He, is, he has been tarrying for far too long, but he will, in fact, return. And when he returns, he will come in great power and great glory as the conquering lion of Judah. But at this time, we also remember that Jesus first came as a meek and humble, sacrificial lamb to be mocked and beaten and put to death for our sins. And so as we eat of the bread, we are remembering Jesus's body crushed for us. And as we drink of the cup, we are remembering Christ's blood poured out for us. When Jesus was on the cross, he carried our sins to the grave. In him, in him we are forgiven, and in him we receive new life. If you are a baptized believer in Christ this morning, you ought to partake in the Lord's Supper. But if you are not in Christ this morning, if you are not a Christian, I would encourage you to let the elements pass by you. And as you see others partaking around you, let that be speaking to you. That Christ has not rejected you, but you have rejected him. But this morning, today, it can all change. Christ will receive you into his kingdom if you would but humble yourself, repent, and put your faith in Jesus. Would you please join me in prayer? Father, we boldly come before the throne of grace and we ask forgiveness of our sins. Even after your son Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins, we have still stumbled into sin. We have sinned in our thoughts. We have sinned with our eyes. We have sinned with our words. We have sinned by our actions. And we have sinned in our hearts. We have failed you in the things we have done, as well in the things that we should have done, but failed to do. But though we have failed you, Father, we recognize that the blood of Jesus is greater than all of our sin. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that though our record of sin is great, in Christ we have all been, or in Christ we have all been washed clean and made pure. And it's because you have done this great thing for us that we want to live holy and righteous lives before you. Help us now as we pass out these elements. Help us to search our hearts and to repent of sin so that we may not have anything hindering us from walking in step with your Holy Spirit. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus, taking the cup, said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins, making a way for us to receive eternal life. Lord, we long for your return. We long to be united with you in your heavenly kingdom. But until that day comes, we will proclaim your gospel. We will proclaim your death and your resurrection for the forgiveness of sins so that others may hear and be saved. Father, I pray that we have glorified you this morning in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. celebrate your resurrection today and God it's just just such a joyful day today and I pray that that everyone in this room would feel the joy of your presence today and that we would recognize the price that has been paid for us the ransom that we have been a beneficiary of and God that we would see the power of your blood that we would be in all of your word and of the story that you've allowed us to be a part of Pray that we would continue our hearts of worship. And God, that you would just give Trent the words that you have. You would anoint him with your spirit and with his words. And God, that you would give us softened hearts to be encouraged and convicted by your word today. Pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. He is risen. Amen. Kids are now dismissed. And so as a reminder, uh, out these doors to the left is nursery. And then out these doors to, to your right is Children's Church, ages uh, pre-K through first. So, and the rest of you, I, um, as I was preparing for this sermon, uh, well, first of all, I just want to say I'm so glad that everyone is here this morning. Uh, let me not get ahead of myself. I, I, I just see all of your, your faces and just thankful that... The Lord has brought you here. I don't know why the Lord has brought you here. Uh, Some of you, uh, I I know for a fact, the reason why you're here is because you are clinging to the cross of Christ as your only hope of salvation. Um, Some of you may be here just because you had a family member and they begged you to be here. And they said, hey, it's Easter. Would you please at least come with to, to church with me on Easter? And they wore you down and you're finally here. And you know what? Even if that is the case, I believe that the Lord can transcend that and still work in your heart and that you are here for a reason. If you are a faithful believer in Christ, you are here to be strengthened and encouraged by the gospel, 
by the news that Christ is, is alive and he is reigning. He is on the throne and that he is coming again to uh, raise all who have died in Christ to life and to, and to glorify us uh, with new glorified bodies in the same way that Christ has been raised and glorified and that we will reign and rule with Christ in a new heaven and a new earth. Some of you are here for that reason just to simply proclaim that. And then others of you are like, it's a seasonal holiday and this is just what you do. And, you know, it, it reminds me of, of, of new beginnings because that's kind of what springtime is. East, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, it, it's a kind of a movable holiday, but it still falls at the beginning of spring. And with spring comes new life. And, and the, the gospel story is a, is a, is a good story. It is a, it is a triumph, you know, a, a triumphal, triumphant, that's the word, triumphant story. It, it has a happy ending where, you know, this man was born and he came to a people that rejected him and they beat him and they mocked him and they crucified him. And yet when, when all seemed lost and he was in the grave and he was in the tomb and, and they thought that their savior was dead, then on the third day he, he rose to life and there was an angel there and he said, he is not here for he is risen. And so that story for you, may not be the truth that you cling to. Cling to. You may, maybe, maybe you believe it, but you don't cling to it. Maybe, maybe you're skeptical of it, and you, you, you've heard the story, but you don't really know if, if you believe it. Um, and, and really, you're just here because, I mean, uh, even though maybe you, you're not clinging to the story, maybe you don't believe the story, it's still, it's still a good story, and you like to listen to it because it reminds you of, of new beginnings, and it gives you hope, and it inspires you that, that even though things may seem bad, maybe, maybe, maybe things look bad in my life, but maybe still there's hope for me yet. Maybe, maybe things will turn around, and my, my story will have a happy ending. I don't know why you're here. Some of you, I recognize your face, you're here all the time, and other, others of you are, are new, and I'm so thankful you're, you're here. But whatever the reason is that you're here, Know that God has brought you here. I know that God has brought you here. That God, um, he is in control. He is sovereign over all things. And he has brought you here to hear the message of Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins. And so if you are a skeptic this morning, or you're just not trusting in Jesus, I pray that the spirit would work on your heart, that, would, that the, the, the message of the gospel would permeate your very soul and that you would come to new life. So, with that, would you please join me in prayer as we ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, as we turn to your word, we ask that you would just do a mighty work in our hearts. We know that we need your Holy Spirit to be working in order for us to truly grasp its meaning and for it to truly take root in our hearts and for us to live it out for your glory I pray that you would just open our eyes this morning. I pray that for those who, who may not be walking very closely with you, may not be walking with you at all this morning, that they would hear the gospel message for the first time and that they would come to new life, Lord. So I pray this morning, as I do every, as I, as I attempt to do every Sunday, Father, would you please just remind me that I need to preach as a dying man preaching to dying people. This may be the only time that I get to share the gospel with, with some of the people that you have brought here this morning. Help uh, fuel me, help, help empower me this morning to deliver the message that you have prepared for us, for us all. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. So as I realized that Easter was you know, coming early this, this year in, in our calendar, and I realized that Resurrection Sunday fell on Easter, or I'm sorry, fell on, <laughs> fell on March. Resurrection Sunday always falls on Easter, just so you know. Um, but that Resurrection Sunday fell on March 31st. And I thought that was very ironic because that means that the next month is April and that the next day would be April 1st. And that means that it's April Fool's Day. And... I thought it was very ironic because on Resurrection Sunday, we remember and we celebrate the wisdom of God put on full display 
through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then in contrast to that, you have April 1st, April Fool's Day, which highlights and sort of celebrates the foolishness of man. I'm not saying that it's, it's necessarily a sinful day, put, pulling a little fun practical jokes on people. Um, but I'm just saying it, it, is, you, it is highlighting foolishness. And so we have these, these two days uh, sandwiched together, side by side. We have the wisdom of God next to the foolishness of man. And so before we look at our main text this morning, I want to first read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. And I just want you to hear the Apostle Paul speaking uh, and, and hear what he has to say about foolishness. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not, for in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, a folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So in other words, what Paul is saying is that the world thinks that the gospel of Jesus Christ is complete and utter foolishness. Because in the wisdom of God, death, our greatest enemy, is defeated by a man who is subject who, who has subjected himself to death. So Christians say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And the world says back to the Christian, your Lord and Savior is dead. And then the Christian says, no, 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 no. It is true that he did die, but he has been raised from the dead. And then the world says back to the Christian, how foolish of you to believe in fairy tales. But God says this is his wisdom that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, who would humble himself and he would take on flesh and he would willingly hand himself over to lawless men to be mocked and beaten and scourged and he would have a crown of thorns placed on his head and he would be strict, stripped naked, humiliated before his own very creation and they would crucify him and put him to death but not for his own sins for he was perfect and innocent and blameless no he suffered and endured all of that for our sins for our sake and this is the wisdom of God that on the third day Jesus would rise from the dead. That Jesus would come out of the grave. And through his great love and mercy and grace, he would extend this offer of forgiveness and new life to all who would believe this foolishness of Jesus Christ crucified and forgiven. And, and sorry, Jesus Christ crucified and risen for the forgiveness of sins. The world laughs at us. The world mocks their creator. But we who have heard the gospel, who have had the Holy Spirit impress upon our hearts that the message is true and that Jesus alone has the power to save and to forgive, 
we look to God who is wise and we say, I want to agree. I want to be wise with you. I want to trust in Christ. And you receive new life. This is the wisdom of God pitted against the foolishness of this world, of this wicked age. And so is it ironic that Resurrection Sunday falls right next to April Fool's Day? Yes, but it is also, the, it paints for us the perfect picture of how the wisdom of God is being worked out in a world of people claiming to be wise who have become fools by rejecting God and rejecting Christ, his son, in whom he has sent. This is uh, an incredible day. And so from this idea, from this idea that God's wisdom is seen as foolishness by the world really comes the first point, the first portion of my message to you all this morning. I want to argue this morning, just take a little bit of time to argue that believing in the resurrection of Jesus is not only reasonable, but that given the evidence, it is actually unreasonable not to believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And then my next portion, just so that maybe help you follow along. After I talk about that, I'm going to talk about uh, what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means to us, and then also how you can receive the blessing that comes with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so my first point, again, arguing for the resurrection of Christ, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I will start by reading verses 1 through 11. This chapter that we're looking at, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11, this is the longest chapter in the Bible that deals specifically with the resurrection. And so Paul says, beginning in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. So Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth. And he says, I want to talk to you all about this gospel that I've already delivered to you, the, the gospel that you are now standing forgiven of your sins, this gospel that I preach to you, that, that you're not supposed to listen to anything else, you're not supposed to deviate from this gospel message. I want to talk about this again because you need to hold fast to this truth. And there are certain very specific things that you must believe in order for this gospel message to have the power to take away your sins. And one of those things that you must believe is the historical truth of Jesus that is found, he lists it in verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, he says, 
that Christ died for our sins. He's, he really died, not figuratively, not metaphorically. He didn't fake it. He really died. And then verse 4, that he was raised on the third day. Like really, really raised, bodily raised. Not just spiritually raised. Not just like, you know, he's, in our, he's been raised in our hearts. No, he really came back from the dead. He says, you have to believe these things. And so the first thing you must believe is that Christ died for our sins. Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Son of God. He didn't just die. He died for a divine purpose. He died for our sins. And yet he was sinless, right? That is completely unlike us. For the Bible, when it's speaking of us, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, right? And then if you think, well, I'll just, I'll just be really good. I'll just be a good person. No, the Bible takes that away from you too, because in the Bible, God speaks about those good works that you want to boast in, and he says they are like filthy rags, all of your righteous deeds, filthy rags before me. And so there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. You're a sinner without hope. Right? That's why we needed a Savior. And so, God, the Father, He sends His perfect Son to stand in the place of sinful men and women. And He bears our sins in His body. He dies the death that we all deserve. And so, Paul says, it is true. Christ died for our sins. And then the evidence that he gives for that is he says it was in accordance to the scriptures. And so Paul is saying one of the reasons why you can know for sure that Christ died for our sins is because if we look to the scriptures, if we look to the prophets, and when, he, when he's talking about the, the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament here. So he says, look to the Old Testament, look to the scriptures. We're going to see that Jesus' death, that the the death of the Messiah, the death of the Christ that was promised to come, it was foretold, it was predicted. And so, for example, if we look to the story of Abraham, Genesis 22, we see that God did not require Abraham to sacrifice his own son Isaac, but instead God provided a substitute, a lamb, right? Right? And that lamb was pointing to Jesus who would come. As did all of the other Old Testament animal sacrifices. They were all pointing to Jesus. And then if you want to fast forward to you know, New Testament times, you got the, the book of John. And in John chapter 1, verse 29, you have John the Baptist. And he sees Jesus walking by and he says, Behold! The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was that Lamb that Abraham prophesied about. That God would provide a substitute who would take away the sins of the world. We also see Psalm 22 predict very specific details of Jesus' death at the cross. Psalm 22, beginning in verse 16. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And if you read through the Gospels, that's exactly what happened. And then Isaiah 53, just the most beautiful and convicting passage about Jesus being the suffering servant who lays his life down to save sinners just like us. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And now going back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4, Paul says, in case you were wondering, 
if Christ really died, he would, uh, you should also know that he was buried. And that's what you do with dead people. You bury them. You put them in a tomb. And the scriptures tell us that there was this heavy stone that was rolled over the entrance of the tomb. And then it was sealed with a Roman seal. And then stationed around that tomb were Roman soldiers. And those Roman soldiers were in charge of making sure that no one came in and stole the body. So that no one would, you know, fake his resurrection. And so they're there protecting this lifeless body of Jesus. And some will say, well, well, maybe the resurrection didn't happen. Maybe the, the Roman guards fell asleep and then the, the disciples came in and stole the body. But that, that's very implausible because for a Roman soldier to fall asleep on the job was punishable by death. For these Roman soldiers, they did not fall asleep. They were on guard duty and they endured the nights. The nights. And these Roman soldiers, they also knew. Like, maybe Jesus wasn't really dead. Maybe he was just really, really wounded. He was really wounded so much that he just kind of was placed in the tomb. They thought he was dead, but he wasn't really dead. And then he just kind of healed on his own. And then he just kind of came walking out in a couple, a couple days later. That is also highly unlikely because this is Roman centurions, right? These Roman soldiers, they were experts at death. They knew how to kill. They knew what a dead body looked like. They sat around thinking of ways of how to make executions all the more painful, the most excruciatingly painful as possible. And they knew how to finish their victims off. Hence the crucif you know, oh, crucifixion, right? It's painful, it's torturous, it's horrible. And so Jesus, he was really dead. He was laid in the tomb. And so as the Roman soldiers, they're guarding the tomb to make sure that no one comes to steal away the body in the middle of the night. All of a sudden, the angels come and, and the, the stone is rolled away. And, and Jesus is walking out of the tomb. But the, and the Roman soldiers, they're like dead men. They fall down and, and the women, they, they will come and they will, they will testify that the tomb is, is, is empty. And then they will go run back and they will tell everybody but again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Paul's line of reasoning here, he says, then verse 4, that Jesus was raised from the dead also in accordance to the Scriptures. So his death was according to the Scriptures, but also his resurrection is in according to the Scriptures. So is it? What, what was Paul being true here? Yes. Psalm 16, verse 10. King David, he writes, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. And for hundreds of years, hundreds of hundreds of years, people thought that that scripture was about King David. But then on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God is being poured out on people, on believers in Christ, when the Spirit is being poured out, Peter, the Apostle Peter, he stands up and he delivers a sermon, a message, and he quotes this verse. And he says, guys, you can go. To David's tomb. We know where it is. And if you go there, what you're going to find is that it's still occupied. David's body is still in there. His skeleton is still in there. And so David wasn't speaking of himself here. Peter says David was, was prophetically speaking about Christ who was to come. This is about Jesus. And so yes, the scriptures attested to, predicted, foretold that Jesus would be raised to life. And so, Paul has said in, in this chapter so far that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures and He was raised to life according to the Scriptures. And now in verse 5, he says, And then He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all to one untimely born. He also appeared to me. So not only does Paul appeal to Scripture as evidence as for, for the death and resurrection of Jesus, but he also appeals to eyewitness testimony. And he names a number of people, one of which is Cephas, otherwise known as Peter, Simon Peter. Then he says that Jesus appeared to the twelve. That's subtracting Judas and adding Matthias. 
Then Jesus appeared to over 500 disciples at one time. And then Paul says, finally, he appeared to me, to Paul. And so by him also saying that he appeared to all of these people, that's 513 plus witnesses, because he says that he appeared to more than 500 brothers, right? There's probably women, children there. I mean, who knows how big the number is? He appeared to all of them at once. And then he says, and most of them are still alive. The vast majority of them are still alive. And so what what he's saying there is, hey, you don't have to just believe me. You can go talk to these people. These people can tell you what they have seen, what they have witnessed. They can, they can verify that the things that I'm saying to you about Jesus' death and resurrection is true. Don't just take my word for it. Appeal to all of these witnesses. They can t- they're can they telling you the same thing. And so Paul doesn't just say, yeah, we have a few witnesses. We have one or two. We have 12. No, he says, we have over 513 witnesses. And they're all saying the same thing, that they saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. And so after saying this, Paul seems to view this as very sufficient evidence to prove that the validity of the, of the gospel message to, is true. But throughout the years, throughout the centuries, many skeptics have, a, have arisen, right? And many of them say, whoa, now wait a minute, Paul. There is, is a flaw in your reasoning. Your claims don't actually prove anything because there is something fundamentally wrong with what you are claiming. You're, you're, you're saying that we must believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead based on eyewitness testimony. But I don't know if you know people very well, but people have a tendency to lie. They're prone to lie. Does that not create a wrinkle in your logic? How do we know that all of these people are not lying about Jesus being raised from the dead? Well, because a lie is only successful if the truth remains concealed. And the more people you have caught up in a lie, the harder it is to keep all the stories straight and to keep the truth hidden. And with 500 plus people trying to to keep straight the story of Jesus being raised from the dead, it becomes extremely difficult to maintain this hoax, this lie. Because it only takes a few of, of, of the believers, of, of, the, of the eyewitnesses, it only takes a few of them to crack under the pressure of persecution. And believe me, they were persecuted. It only takes a few of them to crack under the pressure and say, yeah, we all we made it up. We just wanted to make much of ourselves. We just wanted to, to be a, a part of something big and cool and fun. It only takes a few people to, to, to say that. Or it only takes a few people who want to see this Jesus movement die, who hate Jesus and spurn his name. And there are plenty of those around as well. It only takes a few of them to say, hey guys, we're gonna come up with evidence for the fact that Jesus has not been raised from the dead. And if you read the scriptures, if you read the historical documents, what you find is they couldn't present anything. That even the Pharisees, when they come in, who the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders of the day, who are against Jesus, they come in and they don't say, Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead. No, they come in with this other, you know, uh, heretical teachings saying, oh, but you have to do works of the law. It's not all about grace, the, the grace of Jesus Christ. But, but they come in trying to pull the people away in a different way. They're trying to pull the people away from Christ by making them believe something that's not true. But they don't ever say, don't believe in Christ because he hasn't been raised. They have, they have nothing to back up their claim. While on the other hand, all of these Christians have lots of evidence to back up their claim. The scriptures predicted it, and a lot of people saw it. Well, that's if... You know, all of them are lying. And then so others have said, well, 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 it's not that all of them are lying. It's not that the 500 or the the masses are lying. It's more, more likely that it's just like this inner circle of the 12. It's just these few people who are lying and they have, they have deceived the masses. So what they, what they did is they, though they're unskilled and uh, they, they somehow snuck in and they stole the body of Jesus and then they got a man. 
who was kind of about the same size and stature. He kind of resembled Jesus a little bit. And then they, they paraded him around in front of a lot of people. And maybe they made him open his mouth and say a few Jesus, Jesus-y type words. Um, and they're like, he kind of looks a little different. And he kind of looks a little, and he kind of sounds a little different. And they're like, yeah, it's just, you know, he, he's resurrected. He's a little bit different. He's, you know, uh, you go through death. He, he sounds a little bit different. Um, they, they just say whatever they, they can to make people believe that Jesus has really been raised from the dead. And so it's not the masses that are, are lying. It's just these few people. Let me tell you why that is, is just very far-fetched and highly unlikely. One, all someone, like, I mean, there's no way that these disciples get past these Roman guards. And, uh, and two, liars make lousy martyrs. Liars make terrible martyrs. And so, don't just think <laughs> that everything was, was, was all hunky-dory in the first century, that they believed in Jesus Christ and just it was smooth sailing from there. No, there was intense persecution. Uh, Christians were being put to death right and left. The Apostle Paul, that we're reading so much uh, uh, of his words that he penned through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he put a lot of them to death himself before he was converted to Christ. And so you have all these people who are, who are putting their faith in Jesus, knowing that most likely they're gonna, they're gonna die for their faith. And that's exactly what happened with these apostles. 11 of them, we have historical evidence um, that suggests or flat out tells us that all of them were martyred for their faith. And one of them, they try to get rid of all 12 of them, but one of them, John, he was a little resilient, and they, though they tried to kill him, he, he ended up, he kept living. And so they just exiled him to an island called Patmos, where he lived out his days in exile. Just get away from us, you know. So again, it's highly unlikely that, that anyone's lying here. Liars make terrible martyrs. And there are other pushbacks from skeptics from the, that, that come from the foolishness of this world when they're talking about Jesus and these other pushbacks, these other claims that they, that they come up with trying to refute Jesus, they're, they're, they, they, they become more ridiculous and more far-fetched as, as you dig into them. And it's not even really worth debating over them because they can all easily be uh, logically reasoned with. Uh, they, you, you, you can... Um, you can find the straw man in all of their arguments, right? And so it's really not even worth debating with these people because all of these people, no matter how much evidence that you present to them, they have already determined in their hearts that they are going to reject Jesus Christ. And so they're just grasping for straws because they don't want to believe. They don't want to have to be accountable to another person. They want to live for their lives, uh, live for themselves. They want to be their own God and they, they hate Jesus. The world hates Jesus. And so they, they will always try to come up with, with new claims and new reasons of why Jesus has not been raised from the dead. But we know the truth. So that is my first point. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for sins and was resurrected on the third day, it's not only reasonable to believe, but given the evidence, it is unreasonable not to believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Now, I want to move on to what the resurrection of Christ truly means for us as sinners. Look at verses 12 through 19. Paul says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection... I am... uh, Can't speak. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. 
So the problem here that Paul is addressing as he's writing this letter to Corinth is not so much that people are saying Christ has not been raised from the dead, but that they are speaking more broadly. They're speaking in a more general sense that there just, there just simply is no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. And so what Paul says is he says, hey, whoa, whoa wait a minute. Um, if, if there's no broader sense of a future resurrection of the dead, then that means that not even Christ has been raised from the dead. Because you're simply saying that being raised from the dead is not real. It's impossible. Um, and so that's actually really bad news for, for those who trust in Christ because everything really kind of hinges on the fact that Jesus has been raised to life. And so he's saying, you can say that Jesus is your Savior. You can say that he died for your sins, that you put all of your hope in him. But Paul says, basically, look, you can say that all of you want, but at the end of the day, it's all just nonsense, and it doesn't mean anything if Christ has not been raised. If there is no such thing as a resurrection, then there is no such thing as forgiveness of, of your sins. And that is terrible news for the Christian. Your salvation in Jesus would be a lie. It would be, your faith would be worthless if Jesus is not raised from the dead. If Christ died on the cross, but he didn't rise again, then the cross does not have the power that you think it has. In fact, it would be empty. Everything hinges on the resurrection of Christ. If the tomb is not empty, then you are still in your sins. And Christians who have died, they're not just dead, right? They are perishing. They are paying for their own sins, and they are perishing in the fires of hell. This is the... Jesus being raised from the dead is of eternal importance. It is not just, well, if Jesus isn't really raised from the dead, I'm still going to trust in, in Jesus, and I hope that God will, will, will forgive me of my sins. No, Paul says, if you are claiming that Jesus has forgiven you of your sins, and you're, you're claiming that, that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you're sinning because you're misrepresenting God. Actually, us Christians should be most pitied because we are serving, we are living our lives for the Lord, for Christ, and, and you may be suffering for Jesus on, on, it, on account of his name, and at the end, God is just going to be upset with you because how dare you misrepresent the creator of the universe? You'd be misrepresenting God. We would be most pitied. We would have hope only in this life, only to find out that we were utterly wrong. And we have no hope at all. And so Paul, he ventures into all of this hypothetical talk about what if. He plays the what if game. And he says, what if Jesus has not been raised from the dead? Well, then you're dead in your sins and you have no hope. And we should really all just you know, disperse or wasting our time. And while he's willing to talk about the hypothetical, he is completely convinced that the exact opposite is true. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So he makes it very clear that, the, the, that he, Jesus is the first fruits. He's the first to be raised from the dead. But then things, <clears throat> things in redemptive history, God is working out things in order to his timetable. And so if you're looking to the Christians who have died in the faith and you're wondering, well, why aren't they raised from the dead? He says, no, 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 no. Things are going to happen in their certain precise order that God has ordained and planned out. Christ is raised first, he is exalted, and it's at his coming, it's at his second coming, that then the dead in Christ will be raised. Then, so verse 24, 
Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted. Who put all things in subjection under him? So Jesus is perpetually uh, humbling himself, submitting himself to the Father. That's what he's saying there. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So after Paul says, hypothetically, hypothetically, let's just venture out on this, on this cliff. If Jesus has not really been raised from the dead, then you are still in your sins and you have no hope of eternal life. But then he says, but on the contrary, Christ has been raised from the dead. The tomb is empty. He died according to the scriptures. He's been raised according to the scriptures. All of the people have witnessed it. You can go talk to him. You can go ask him about what they've seen. The, the angels were there. They declared that he is not here, that, he, that Christ is risen. The women saw it. They went back to the disciples and it went on from there and there as Jesus appeared to over 513 people. And you can have confidence that Jesus' death has accomplished salvation for sinners in Adam, all have died, but in Christ, all shall be made alive. And you can know that that is true because God has raised him from the dead. His sacrifice was accepted. God vindicated Jesus. He cleared him of all proposed charges. He said he was innocent. He carried your sins to the cross and you can be forgiven. Or he carried your sins from the cross to the grave and you, you can be forgiven in Christ and have new life. That is, that is the wisdom of God pitted against the foolishness of this world who says, ah, Jesus is dead. The promise is for God's people, those who turn to Jesus this is the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives us eternal life. But eternal life is not automatically applied to you. Jesus' death doesn't just universally save all people. God would desire that all people would not perish, but that they would repent and that they would find repentance and, and put their faith in Jesus and that they would receive eternal life. God doesn't want to condemn anybody for their sins. He, that's why God took on flesh and said, I'll take your sins for you. But it doesn't automatically take away your sins. The, the, the blood of Jesus doesn't automatically wash away your sins. There is something that you must do. You have to respond rightly to the gospel message that is preached to you this day, if you are not in Christ, if you're maybe still skeptical of, of this, I would have a, a word of warning to you that when Christ came out of the grave, not only was he never to die again, but God exalted him above every other name. He had given him all authority in heaven and earth. And one day Jesus is coming again to raise the dead in Christ. But the scriptures also speak that Jesus will also judge the living and the dead. And so while Jesus came as this meek and humble sacrificial lamb who dies for the sins of the world, he will come again as the lion of Judah and the righteous judge. And his judgment will be just. And those who are not in Christ will go to hell. And no one will be able to argue with his judgment because it will be right. God is just, but he is also gracious. And he loves you. And he, is a, he has made a way for you to be saved. But you have to humble yourself and you have to hear the message of Jesus Christ 
and you have to put your faith in him. You have to first agree with God that you are a sinner deserving of hell, that you have rebelled against God and that, and that you need a savior. And then you have to look to his son in whom God has sent and said, everyone who believes in the name of my son, they shall be saved. You have to do that. And the Apostle Paul makes it very clear, and this is where I will end. Romans 10, 9 through 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The world says that trusting in Jesus is foolish, but what will you say? Who is wiser, man or God? What is your decision? Has God opened your eyes today? Do you know in your heart that Jesus has been crucified and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins? And you say, I need him. He is my only hope of salvation. I pray that that is your decision. If you are not in Christ, that you would repent and trust in him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your son in whom you have sent, whom you have accomplished salvation in your name, and that you freely give it to those who humble themselves and repent and trust in Christ. I ask that anyone who has delayed or has put off this this invitation in the past, or maybe they're hearing it for the first time this morning, that if they are not in Christ, that they would be moved, that your Holy Spirit would, would move them to put their faith in Christ. They would follow him in this life. And if they follow you in this life, that they will receive the promise that if they follow you in this life, they will also follow you in, on the last day, in the day of the resurrection. They will be raised to new life. Father, you are just, you are good, you are worthy of honor and praise, and we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Please stand with us and worship with us. Thank you.
do want to thank you again for, for coming and joining us in worship this morning. Um, if this is your first time, I do want uh, to let you know that we usually have a Bible study at 6 o'clock tonight, but tonight it has been uh, canceled. And so enjoy this time with your families. And I'm going to turn it over to our Deacon of the Week, Ethan Epperson, and he's going to pray us out. But thank you for joining us on this Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Bow with me. Dear our Father, thank you for one day you've given us to gather in your house. And just thank you for filling your spirit as a friend today as you give us a message. And just please let us go out and spread your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.